I am an oceanographer. Ever since my family started bringing me to the beach when I was young, I was fascinated by the sea. But fascination turned to something else when I was hired to work in an underwater sea lab in the Baltic. My name is Will. I had recently graduated with a degree in marine biology and was looking to start my career. I had always thought that the only underwater research lab had been off the coast of Florida, the Aquarius Reef Base. But here I was, staring at an application to work on another sea lab across the world. I chalked my lack of knowledge up to my own incompetence and applied for the job. It wasn't long before I got a reply. A sophisticated man with a German accent spoke with me about my education and all the other regular things that you would hear in a job interview. But at the end of the conversation, things started to get a little weird. Are you in any way afraid of any sea life, like sharks for example? Asked Bertram, the German interviewer. I have a healthy fear of ocean predators, I said, but I don't mind swimming with them. They mostly aren't interested in humans. Good to hear, he said. I completely agree. The job will involve some diving in some deeper waters, and this can make some people uneasy. To my surprise, I was hired. I boarded a plane and ended up in Rostock, a medium-sized German port city. I made my way over to the port itself where I was to meet with the team and start traveling to my new home under the sea. I had read the documents they had sent over to familiarize myself with the underwater environment. I had noticed, however, that there were no bathrooms, and this seemed a little strange. I assumed that I probably would just go in the ocean. I had been peeing in the ocean since I was a kid, but I had never gone number two. I laughed to myself as I thought of how silly it was that I was dwelling on such a triviality. When I arrived on the dock, there was Bertram. I recognized him from the video conference we'd had before. He was taller than I had figured. Next to him stood another tall skinny man. Ah, speak of the devil, Bertram said as I approached. His accent made me chuckle to myself, but his grammar and diction were very good nonetheless. Well, I would like you to meet Derek, our colleague. Derek also seemed very polite and his English was excellent. We have a team of French, German, and English speakers. We mostly speak English, but you'll have to forgive us if we occasionally start ranting in our native tongues together," said Bertram. At that, Derek mumbled something in German, and they both laughed. We hitched a hike on another vessel out towards the east. After about an hour, I saw a little ship. This is the Hafnung, said Bertram, our humble ship. The ship was small and rusty. It looked like it had seen better days. Something seemed off. The facility on the water was much too advanced to be paired with such a beat up looking ship. We geared up for the dive. As far as depth is concerned, the Baltic is pretty shallow, yet I was surprised to hear that we would be diving to a depth of 65 meters. The deepest I had ever gone was 30, and going 65 didn't help my growing anxiety. Don't worry, it's a one-way trip, you don't have to worry about the bends. I remembered how cool it was that the underwater facility used ambient pressure in a moon pool. The entire facility was pressurized. It was still too deep for humans to live at the pressure between 7 and 8 atmospheres. Though humans can free dive quite deep, they cannot live in such crushing pressures for extended periods of time. Three atmospheres was what the facility was pressurized to. Still, the time saved not having to go back and forth between sea level and seven atmospheres made this facility useful for studying the seabed. We have all heard how we know less about our oceans than outer space. This was what fascinated me so much about the sea. The beginning of the descent was uneventful. Things started to become darker as less light was able to penetrate the depths. When we reached 40 meters, it felt like I was entering another world. It was surreal. I had never been this deep before, 
and I remembered my diving instructor mentioning how dangerous it was. People were said to fall into a trance. As we continued to descend into the misty depths, a building appeared. It was taller than I had expected, spanning at least three stories upward. Certainly, this was not a facility I had read about. Soon enough, however, I saw the moon pool. It was a peculiar thing to emerge from the ocean into an indoor swimming pool, and we all treaded water for a minute. Bertram and Derek turned and smiled at me. I couldn't help but smile back. It was just so badass. I felt like I was in some kind of sci-fi movie. The room we were in was pressurized higher than the rest of the facility, and we made our way into a depressurization chamber after removing our gear. Watch your arm, said Derek as I clumsily walked into a loose panel. It grazed my skin a little. Sorry, said Bertram. I should have mentioned the loose panel. The facility is much larger than I read, I said, inquiring about the large structure I had seen. Yes, said Bertram. That document is out of date. The facility has expanded in several areas. Though we lowly scientists are to remain in our humble quarters. He and Derek laughed. I thought this facility was entirely run by scientists. I said. The job application had been from the website of Geomar, a prestigious research institution in Germany. It started that way. But after funding was cut back, it looked like we were going to abandon the facility, said Bertram. But then they discovered the ore deposits down the hole. The hole? I asked. We entered the habitat I had familiarized myself with from the manual. There was a bunkhouse, a mess hall, and a couple other rooms for science and storage. Is this the new bloke? asked a voice from around the corner. In walked a short man with a smile on his face. He had instant charisma. Don't let the crowd scare you, mate. Things are peachy down here. He shook my hand with a vigor that left my arm noodling. He was a middle-aged man, a little older than the rest of them. Name's Duck. I'm from Newcastle. I nodded. This whole crowd thing, said Bertram. I just don't understand why you all think it is offensive. It just means cabbage. Your people's World War II put-downs weren't very good. I couldn't help but chuckle at their relationship. When suddenly, a loud explosion rang out. And they all grabbed for something to brace themselves with. Is everyone alright? Came a shrill, worried voice from deeper into the facility amidst the flickering buttons and endless readouts. A French woman cautiously came into the room hugging the wall. Despite the fear the crash moments ago had instilled, she smiled politely to me. Welcome, Will. It is good to see you, she said somewhat nervously. Hi, I said, smiling back. She was wearing a cap and bulky crewman coveralls, yet I could tell that she was really beautiful. The bastards are really pushing our luck with those explosions, said Duck. They're gonna get us all killed. Why are there explosions? I asked. We didn't have the funding to keep this place running. We were forced to entice some other parties. I said it then, and I say it now. It was a short-sighted decision. Said Duck. Yes, but what choice did we have? Asked Bertram. The rest of the day was spent familiarizing myself with the facility. Everything was just like it said in the manual. Except for an ominous looking door just after the depressurization chamber. That was new. Though the whole place looked like a futuristic spaceship, this door seemed to be even more so. It looked strong. At first, there was constant traffic in and out, but after they completed their submarine docking station, a soul hasn't passed through that door in months. We occasionally speak with one of them on the radio, but we have less and less contact as they need us less. It is a little strange, but it is better than being shut down said Bertram as he noticed me looking at the door. Who exactly are they? 
I asked. At first, it was underwater welders and construction workers who worked for a German mining company. All the usual stuff. But after several months, the miners left, and apparently ownership of the facility changed hands again. Though, I have never heard about who. Geomar has been vague about it all. No doubt, they are up to some kind of exploitative act. Probably attempting to weaponize something beautiful. And that is why I get the feeling that we are no longer welcome in our own facility. They wouldn't want their secrets exposed by us pesky good-intentioned scientists. Said Bertram laughingly. Eventually, I had to go to the little boy's room, and I finally inquired as to how this was done. They all laughed. It is a pleasure going number two during the day. The fish can get quite frisky, said Duck. Men unrolled their eyes, smiling. The fish sometimes eat your waist, she said. Don't let Douglas scare you. They are just fish. There is a dome several meters out from the moon pool where you can hang out and do your business. But you won't catch me going out there in the dark, said Duck. Yeah, I can imagine the fish are much more frightening in the dark, I said. Actually, that is the weird part, said Bertram. There are no fish at night. Men unlashed the shirt she was holding at Bertram's arm punishingly, yet in a soft, motheringly way. I'm just saying, I don't go number two at night either, said Bertram. If it is an emergency, I drop the lock right in the moon pool, and you should too, said Duck. Floaters be damned. That is disgusting, said Manon. Why don't the fish come at night? I asked. We aren't sure why. Derek thinks it has to do with their body chemistry. Their noradrenaline levels start to spike as the light stops shining through. They scatter in all directions, explained Manon. All except towards the hole, said Derek. What is this hole? I asked. It is the 20 meter white hole in the bottom of the ocean out the moon pool to the east. It is hard to miss. We stay away from there, said Derek. I made a point to do my business during the daylight and was alarmed and amused by the amount of fish it attracted. I swam out to the dome and soon, several fish began to investigate me. I looked around in the area and saw the massive hole to the east. I could see that the facility must have been built to study the hole. It was starting to get a little darker, and I was ready to swim back to the moon pool when I noticed a small submersible ascending out of the hole. The submersible propelled itself towards the large three-story complex attached to our habitat. A hatch opened, and the submersible ascended up into the hatch. My imagination ran wild as to what this mysterious other faction was up to behind that hatch. As weird as it all was, after several days, I had fallen into a rhythm and everything became normal. I would gather samples and document the wildlife by day and study my findings as well as talk to my colleagues at night. Occasionally, there would be an explosion, and like clockwork, a submersible or two would ascend from the hole at sunset. Sunset became a time of caution I noticed. The fish would remain until it was dark, but almost in a flash, they all knew to disappear as the last sun rays left. It was a part of a fascinating cycle. I had seen things like this in nature before, like when bats all fly out of a cave at the same time, or birds migrating for winter. But this was different. There was a desperation about it. For the fish, it was more of a desperate scramble. I quickly understood why Duck wouldn't go number two at the dome after dark. I found out that none of them did. Every day I would walk by the mysterious door leading to the other facility, but the hallway beyond was always dark, and I could never see that far. It was unnerving. On top of that, there were no portholes or windows of any kind to look into from the outside. Only the submersibles at sunrise and at sunset. One day I joked. Maybe one of us should try to swim up to the hatch one time? I said. The mood in the room became very tense. It wasn't long before Manon burst into tears. I didn't understand. I'm sorry, I said. It's okay, mate. 
It isn't your fault, said Doc, as he went to console Manon. I tried to look at Bertram, who usually explained things to me when I was baffled, but his eyes remained fixed on his breakfast. I looked at Derek. It is time Will knows about Javier, said Derek. Nobody said a word. All that could be heard was Manon sobbing. Who is Javier? I asked. Javier was the marine biologist you replaced, said Derek. And he also had the idea to swim up the hatch. We were informed that he was dead over a week later. The bastards, said Duck. We began searching desperately, but after a couple of hours, we knew that the air would have run out. We started searching for his body. Apparently the whole time, he was in the other facility. What? I asked, mortified. Aye, they said that there had been an accident, and they weren't able to save him, said Duck. And they waited to tell you? I asked. He nodded. I never looked at the hatch the same way. Had Javier been trapped in there and run out of air? Surely there must have been some way he could have entered the facility, as it is how the submersibles went in and out. Over the coming days, things went back to normal. Or at least, as normal as living 60 meters on the water could be. I didn't dare broach the subject of Javier. I just kept my head down and did my work. There was plenty of plant life to catalog, not to mention all of the different species of fish and jellyfish. Occasionally, a pod of sea mammals would pass through. As I was performing my nightly bathroom ritual before the dark set in, one night, I noticed the submersible ascending from the hole as always. Only this time, it seemed to be having trouble moving through the water. It almost seemed to be stuttering. As I looked closer, I saw what looked like markings on the side of the vessel, as if it had been some kind of accident down there. I shuddered to think what would have happened if the craft had been damaged more. There I tread in the outhouse dome, pondering what I just saw. It made me feel uneasy. But nothing like what I felt after what I saw next. My gaze fell back on a giant sinkhole. There, at the very edge, I saw something that will horrify me for the rest of my life. I saw a head looking back. The rest of the body was hidden down the hole. Just the head. As if it was peering at me. Even with the water clouding the distance between us, I felt his stare burn into my soul. Here, 60 meters below in the middle of the ocean was a face, completely unencumbered by fear. No air tanks. What was he breathing? I must have been hallucinating, but the moment lasted for what seemed like a lifetime. Up until then, it was the longest moment of my life. His eyes locked on mine. Just as it. As it got darker, I came out of my confused trance. I made a mad dash for the moon pool. I didn't dare look back. I leapt out of the moon pool and into the decompression chamber. I was terrified. I stared at the moon pool through the window half expecting the head to emerge from the water. How could a man have been in the hole? He would have had to held his breath for at least five minutes, as I hadn't seen anyone else as I swam to the dome. Although with training, a human being can hold their breath that long, something was just off. I had goosebumps all over my body. I had heard of pressurized air playing tricks on people's minds. Perhaps I had nitrogen narcosis. I quickly went in and told the others. Elevated levels of nitrogen affect us all in different ways, said Manon as she examined me. It is possible that you hallucinated. I must have, I said. If anything like this happens again, come tell us right away, she said. I noticed Derek looking at me from across the habitat. He quickly looked away when I made eye contact. There was something about it that made me feel like he knew more. I decided to sleep it off, but had wild dreams about what I saw. 
I woke in a cold sweat. I felt even more exhausted than before. The crew for the most part hadn't noticed that I was a little off. All except Derek. He approached me that night. You must be feeling a little rattled, he said. I was good friends with Javier. When he died, I sort of lost it a little bit. I couldn't sleep or eat. I even saw things too. He became very serious. This place is dangerous, more so than the others understand, said Derek. He brought me over to a laptop and opened up a folder with images. He then brought up a picture of the crew all happily posing. There they all were. Duck, Manon, Derek, and Bertram. Then my eyes came to rest on the fifth person. And when they did, electricity ran through my body all at once as horror welled up from the depths of my soul into my throat. There stood the very same face that had stared at me from the hole. And all at once, I knew who that was, what Derek had seen, and what it meant. I, I could barely speak. I just muttered. That was the man I saw, I said. We have to tell the others, and they are not going to believe it or like it, he said. We headed into the common room where the others were gathered. Derek led bluntly in a dire tone. We both saw Javier, alive in the water, he said. Doug almost dropped what he was doing and turned around to look at us, then looked at Bertram, who was as bewildered as him. Then, they both broke into laughter. Manon looked very upset. This is not funny, Derek. And Will, I didn't think you were like this, she said. Derek showed me a picture of Javier, and it was without a doubt the same face that looked at me. I said, I didn't care about impressing Manon anymore. Something was horribly wrong. I thought it was my mind playing tricks on me because Javier had just died. I heard you can see people sometimes who have just died, said Derek. So I didn't think much of it. But one thing is very clear. We need to leave. It was empowering to be next to him. I would have never had the courage to say these things. There was a moment of silence. <sighs> okay, I will put in the call for the ship to come pick up whoever wants to leave, I guess. But this is my life's work. I can't just leave because you think you saw a ghost. You understand? Said Duck, respectfully. I strongly urge you to reconsider. Said Derek. And we can't wait for the ship to get us. We need to take the Hafnung. Now. Suddenly, this wasn't sounding like such a good idea. The Hafnung had seen better days. Bertram started to argue with Derek in German. Manon and Duck started jumping in, and I had no idea what was going on. At last, however, Derek went out with a loud exclamation that silenced the rest. He then turned to me. I know it seems like the Hafnung isn't seaworthy, but she is. She passed the required inspection. And that was five years ago, Derek. Really? said Duck. There is a reason we don't use her anymore. She is a floating platform, just in case something happens down here. Really, what is another day to wait for the ship? He said. If you had seen what we had seen, you would understand, said Derek. I wasn't sure what to do. On the one hand, waiting another day for a proper ship to take us back seemed reasonable. Yet, what if that thing in the water came into the moon pool tonight? What if it came into the decompression chamber? Very well, I'm going to make the call to be picked up, said Derek. He left and came back moments later. There is a storm coming. They can't make it here for two days, he said. My stomach started to turn. That the rusty old boat was starting to look more and more enticing. I was starting to feel better about everything. There were tests to be run, and flora to be catalogued. Manon even helped me, which put me at ease. During the day, she started asking me questions. So you are sure that it was Javier that you saw? 
she asked. Yes, I said. He must still be alive. But we watched each other for minutes. I don't know anyone who can hold their breath that long. Manon looked at me horrified. He was a good swimmer, she said. But five minutes? I know, I said. After I finally started to feel normal again, I started to feel tired, even though it was just the afternoon. Something about the pressure or being cooped up. That was why I went to sleep early that night. And going to sleep early turned out to be a giant mistake. I woke up in the late evening around 10. I had to poop something fierce. I instinctively went over to the decompression chamber. When I entered the moon pool, for the first time, I saw pitch black water. I stood there watching it ripple. Beyond was just the murky black depths. I remember Doug admitting he wouldn't go to the bathroom at night. And now, I understood. I walked up to the edge and looked down. There was absolutely no way I was going to swim to the outhouse dome. With little options left, I pulled down my trousers and attempted to squat right over the moon pool. Still, squatting there, I couldn't help but look back every couple seconds to make sure something wasn't coming up to grab me. It felt silly, but it was a very vulnerable position to be in. After trying for a couple minutes, I stood back up. It is amazing what kind of things the body will do when it knows it is not safe. I suddenly felt no urge to go to the bathroom at all. I slowly backed away from the edge of the moon pool, keeping my eyes on its dark, rippling depths. I thought I saw something move. I felt a deep fear. I had to get out of there. I went for the decompression chamber. And to my horror, I saw out of my peripheral a mass cresting out of the water. I threw myself into the chamber and, as fast as I could, tried to throw the door closed. A monstrous dark grayish green tentacle moved with startling speed, and just as I was shutting the door, wrapped around my leg, sinking several spines into me. I cried with pain as the creature began to drag me out of the chamber. I slammed the door on the tentacle, but it was thick and strong and continued to drag me. A second tentacle just like the first was starting to crest out of the moon pool. Just then I looked up. It was the same sheet metal panel that had grazed me when I first walked in. I ripped it off the wall with surprising ease. With all my might, for my life, I cleaved the tentacle. It didn't sever, but I cut it deeply and it released me. Before the second tentacle could reach the chamber, I slammed the door shut with all my might. I looked at the tentacles prodding and probing the sealed door. It was absolutely horrifying. I knew they had every intent on dragging me down into the depths. They were terrifying, like a giant octopus with spiny thorns attached to hook its prey. After what seemed like hours, the decompression finished. I had already been screaming, and the others had gathered at the door. I exited the chamber and turned to the others. We have to get the hell out of here, now! I screamed. Calm down, said Manon. What happened? There is some kind of... I stopped. I didn't know what to say. I know this sounds crazy, but... A massive predatory invertebrate grabbed me in the moon pool. Like a Pacific octopus? Doug asked curiously. They were not understanding the gravity of the situation. The tentacles were indivisible from this angle, and I dared not open the door to show them. Instead, I showed them my leg. It was bleeding, though not profusely. The puncture wounds were still clearly visible. The others began to inspect his leg. Doug went into another room and came back with a couple knives. They were the only weapons we had available. At first light, all of us should make a break for the Hofnung, said Derek. But what about the storm? Said Bertram. I would rather take my chances with the storm than be down here. At least I would die a natural death. Said Derek. I don't think the others understood. But I knew exactly what he meant. The idea of drowning in the open waters somehow seemed like a tolerable alternative. It suddenly made sense. The explosions 
in the pit of submersible. This animal was being studied by the other facility. One thing is certain, said Derek. The creature only seems to be around at night, and we seem to be safe in here. I am swimming to the half nung in the morning. I strongly urge for the rest of you to come. I nodded. The others looked among themselves, not knowing what to think. We all went to our bunks and tried to sleep. After hours of tossing and turning and staring at the entrance, half expecting a dark grey tentacle slither around the corner, my wound felt better. Manon had bandaged it and applied disinfectant. I slowly started to nod off. When I woke, I started my daily routine. I even got ready to go out and swim to the bathroom when I stopped dead in my tracks. I felt a deep sense of horror as I was just remembering what had happened to me in the moon pool just hours before. I suddenly felt no urge to go to the bathroom at all. I just stood there gazing at the pressure chamber. All of the others had risen and were mulling about. Have either of you seen Doc? said Manon. I'm waiting for his data, but I haven't seen him. Maybe he hasn't woken up? I said. He isn't in his bunk, said Manon. I am starting to get worried. He probably just went out for some samples, said Bertram. You're probably right, said Manon, as she started busying herself with her work. I finally worked up the courage to go out to the bathroom dome. The water was moving faster than usual, but nothing I couldn't swim against. I could see how being a poor swimmer could be very hazardous, and understood now why they insisted on strong swimmers in the job application. Out at the dome, I looked around and realized that there wasn't the a fish in sight. Usually during this time of day, the ocean was full of them. But now, it was barren. It was unnerving. I looked around the eerie depths, trying to make out what I could through the misty seawater. I noticed something strange. The hatch to the other part of the facility was open. That same hatch that Javier had swam up. Upon thinking about Javier, my eyes darted back to the place where I'd seen his eyes staring at me from the hole. I shuddered and suddenly started to feel very vulnerable. I got done with my business and started back towards the moon pool. When I entered the habitat, I saw that Manon was coming up my way with Bertram and Derek. There you are, she said. We are going out to look for Doc. He should have been back by now. The hatch is open, I said. And they all looked at one another. We will have to think about that later, she said. Everyone, suit up and make yourself full of oxygen. The water was still moving fast due to the stormy conditions. It was difficult to fight against the current. But Doc should have been back by now. And there was a chance he was stuck and running low on air. We had to look for him. We checked down the slope in the opposite direction of the hole. But there was no sign of Doc. We finally came to the hole. We shone our lights down into the depths. Nothing but darkness. After a while, our oxygen levels were getting low, and we returned to the habitat. On our way back, we all saw the opened hatch. No doubt we were all thinking the same thing. Duck might have gone up the hatch for some reason. When we had shed our gear in the moon pool, Derek was the first to mention this. We need to get in touch with the other part of the habitat, he said. I will try to radio them again. As I walked past the door that connected the two habitats, I peered down its corridor. Surely we could just override the locks and walk in there. It seemed like the right thing to do given the circumstances. I shone my light down the corridor through the glass. It was strange. Something at the very end of the corridor seemed to be floating. I squinted and tried to discern what it was that I was looking at. Hey guys, I said. I think something is moving in there. We all gathered at the glass of the door and peered into the darkness. There was something that seemed to be hovering. It was drifting closer. 
how I knew what it was before my mind could register what I was seeing. It was a strange feeling. On the one hand, there was a pen, but on the other, it was drifting right in the middle of the air. The pen was floating because the chamber had filled with water. It won't break through, said Derek. This door is designed to withstand pressures far beyond this. It was always a possibility that one of the habitats would be compromised. His words did little to reassure me. I kept staring at that pen as it seemed to drift aimlessly. It ricocheted off one of the walls gently. What happened to all the people? asked Bertram. There was nothing but silence for a moment. Then Menon spoke. We have to go in there, said Menon. That must be where Doug is. Maybe he is trapped. Derek and Bertram exchanged glances and started speaking in German. Menon interrupted them and they all started yelling at each other. I stood there puzzled until finally they switched back to English. I can't believe you two, said Menon. Doug would have done it to save you. Doug is dead, said Derek. Or worse. What do you mean or worse, said Menon. He has been out of air for a while now, and we all know it, said Derek. Bertram and I are going for the Hufnung. We aren't waiting for the ship. Bertram stood there looking as guilty as he was terrified. Finally, they were starting to understand. We had to get the hell out of there. I opened my mouth to agree adamantly, but Mammon spoke first. I am going over there, she said defiantly. She looked at me and waited for me to speak. Okay, I said. I will go with you to look for Doug. This is crazy, said Derek. I don't want to be on that sinking boat in a storm any minute longer than I have to. We can't wait for you. One hour, said Manon. That is all we need. Derek and Bertram started arguing in German again. We will wait one hour, said Bertram. Then we will head to the surface together. Suiting up fast, we did our final checks and dove back into the moon pool. The hatch seemed to beckon me. I thought of Javier and how I had seen his head staring at me. Even now it gave me the chills, but I put it in the back of my mind. Soon, we could almost see up the shaft. I thought of how much had happened in my life since I had taken this job, how much I had learned and seen. It was hard to remember what my life used to be like. It seemed like so long ago that I had been sleeping in a nice bed and eating all the food I wanted. Mostly. I thought about how much I had taken for granted. You don't realize how important it is to feel safe until you don't. We reached the entrance of the shaft. It became dark fast. Menon turned on her light, and my heart sank. At the end of the shaft was a metal door, but it looked as though it had been warped. What could have done this? Luckily, our diver's masks had radio communication built in. What could have done this? Said Manon. She looked over at me. She knew what I was thinking already. There is no creature ever discovered like the one you hallucinated Will. I went to retort, but stopped. There was no point in arguing. I wanted to live, not to be right. Let's hope not. I said. It took everything I had, but I managed to start kicking and swim up into the shaft. Menon soon followed after me. We traced the dark room with our lights. It seemed to have been some kind of submersible docking room. What once was a moon pool had been overtaken by water. All manner of clutter floated about. It was unnerving to be in the darkness, 60 meters beneath the surface of the water in a breached habitat that had gone silent. I swatted a tablet away from my head as we continued onward. The decompression chamber was wide open. Both of the large doors stood unsealed. I knew what had happened. That creature that had tried to grab me. That giant octopus creature had gotten through the decompression chamber. A 
I couldn't stop thinking about those tentacles that had grabbed me. They looked like they were as thick as a tree trunk as they disappeared into the black water. I will never forget that. As we swam into the next room, it was large and quite long. It was full of all types of computers and lab equipment. But in the center of a room, and to my horror, and there it was. That same dark gray tentacle. It must have been 50 feet long. I instinctively swam away. This was Horror Movie 101. I had done everything I could to convince Manon that my story was true. If she didn't believe me now, it was on her. To my great relief, I saw her swimming fast behind me. She now understood that our lives were in imminent danger. As we rounded the corner in the room with the hatch, we saw Doug. It seemed like a miracle. There he was, floating there in his diving gear. We made it towards the moon pool and started to get out of our gear. That's when I caught out of the corner of my eye. Doug's oxygen meter had been empty. Still, I didn't think much about it as we made our way to the decompression chamber. I wish I had. Doug, I have to say it is good to see your stupid face, said Manon. Why didn't you respond to my radio? Doug gave a slight smile. We looked everywhere for you, I said. He looked at me. He looked like he had some kind of debris in his eye. Still, he said nothing. He just stared at me. That is when I realized that Bertram and Derek were nowhere to be found. Derek? Bertram? I cried out. You don't think they would have left without us, do you? Asked Manon. Suddenly, I heard a loud crash a distance from the habitat. It was as loud as the explosions. But it was different. I could tell Manon thought the same thing as we looked at each other in horror. Putting it out of our mind, Manon and I desperately scrambled around the habitat. When we returned, we noticed Doug standing by the decompression chamber. He seemed to be examining it. You okay there, Doug? I asked. He turned to me and gave me that same hollow stare. I had seen that stare before. Somewhere. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. He soon returned to the decompression interface. He just stared at it. Any ideas on where Derek and Bertram are, Doug? I asked, more to make conversation than anything else. We stood there in silence for a moment. I dared not walk away. Manon had made her way over to us after searching for Derek. By the look on my face, she could tell that there was something very wrong. Doug? She asked. After a moment of silence, Doug's hand rose and pressed one of the buttons. He pressed another button. He was trying to figure it out. I tried to block the panel. But he swatted me away with his speed that was uncharacteristic of Doug. He was trying to open the decompression chamber. I tried to push him away from the panel, but he hit butted me. Hard. I fell to the ground. I felt woozy. I tried to stand up, but fell over again. Manon! I cried out. Don't let him open the chamber! Manon stood there horrified as I finally got to my feet. But... It was too late. Doug managed to open the decompression chamber. Still, there was a failsafe mechanism. Both doors couldn't be opened at once, unless overridden in an emergency. I had read about it in the manual before I came aboard. There was a way, but if it was done on the water at that depth, the moon pool's integrity would fail, and the water would rush into the habitat. Doug stood there once more, thinking with that horrifying hollow stare. My head was still spinning, but I managed to grab a hold of his arm, and we both went tumbling over. I managed to dodge some swings at my head and scrambled backwards. Doug refocused his attention back on the panel. Suddenly, a loud alarm sounded. It was over. The moon pool integrity had been compromised. Water began to rush in. Manon and I looked at each other in horror. She rushed over to a cabinet. The water was already up to our knees and rising fast. Doug simply stared at us, void of emotion. 
the water poured forth, and in seconds, I had taken a deep breath from the air at the top. I tried to think of something, anything. But before I could, Manon grabbed my hand. She had found a life raft. We swam for it. We both started towards the moon pool, when all of a sudden, I felt a strong hand grip my leg. It was dark. I thrashed and kicked, but to no avail. I tried to fight Duck with all I had left, but he was too strong, and I was running out of oxygen. The edges of my eyes were starting to turn black, and my lungs were crying out. This was it. Suddenly, Manon drove the fixed blade deep into Duck's stomach. He momentarily let go, and we scrambled out of the moon pool with Duck right behind us. To my horror, I saw Duck swimming down after us, blood pouring out. Manon screamed and pointed towards the hole. There was Javier, Bertram, and Derek swimming for us, all with that hollow, lifeless look in their eyes. All we had to do was clear the building above us, and we could pull the ripcord. We were so close. That is when I saw the Hofnung. It was the ship that was supposed to be above us. There it was. I could barely make it out through the murky water, but... It was hard to miss something so big. The storm, or maybe the others had sunk it. That was what the crashing sound had been. We cleared the structure, and just as the creatures were closing in on us, Manon ripped the cord. Holding on, we started to ascend fast. I watched as we left that horrible place behind. It disappeared into the misty ocean underneath my feet. We hung there blind and helpless all the while, thinking to ourselves, what if the others swam up after us? How long would it take them to reach us? My joints were hurting, and I knew why. The compression sickness was setting in. Still, we were alive. The more I strained to look, the more I started to make out several shadows. They were getting closer. I could start to make out the human bodies now. They were no more than several meters away, swimming for us. My joints were in agony, and I felt so tired. I needed to sleep. Still, the sight of the surface so close, its glimmering majesty. Just a little farther. We broke the surface gasping for air. The life raft was so close. We scrambled to it as I felt that fear of having my last leg grabbed. But it wasn't. We had made it. We quickly looked over the side. A chill ran down my spine as I saw right beneath the surface the faces of Javier, Derek, Doug, and Bertram, all of their eyes fixed on us. There they remained, as if unable to break the surface. Doug was still bleeding profusely from his stomach, and a cloud of red was gathering. We collapsed in the bed of the life raft, exhausted. We had made it. We could feel their hands scratching at us through the raft. It was unnerving. But the raft seemed to be holding. The sun was setting, and the sky was a beautiful pink color. That brings us to now. The last light has gone away now. The others are still scratching at the bottom of the raft. The sun is no longer holding it at bay. The creature will surely come for us. Tonight.